Welcome to Voice of the Vatican. Our top stories. Unending mercy. The Holy Father calls for every diocese to create a permanent memorial to the Year of Mercy. Voters tips. Wondering how to assess whether a candidate is worthy of your vote? Archbishop Villegas from the Philippines says the answer lies in the Old Testament. Torch of St. Benedict. A flame of peace returns to Italy amidst fanfare and celebration. Organ harvesting. Voice of the Vatican speaks to an ethicist in Rome about the call for organ donation while the patient is still living. Battling powers and principalities. Exorcists from dioceses around the world gather in Rome for the 11th Annual Exorcist Conference. I'm Ashley Nerona in Rome, Italy, and you're watching Voice of the Vatican only on Shalom World TV. The Holy Father has called for dioceses around the world to carry on the meaning of this Jubilee Year of Mercy long after the year concludes. At a prayer service for Divine Mercy in St. Peter's Square, the Holy Father called for permanent memorials of mercy to be erected throughout the world. He suggested that this might mean establishing a, a hospital, a, a home for the aged or abandoned children, a school in an area of need, or a home for recovering drug addicts. He went on to say that the possibilities for how to create a lasting memorial are many. The theme of mercy was echoed in the Holy Father's words of his Regina Chaley address in St. Peter's Square this week, where he spoke about the healing power of the wounds of Christ. In God's mercy, all of our infirmities find healing. His mercy, in fact, does not keep a distance. It seeks to encounter all forms of poverty and to free this world of so many types of slavery. Mercy desires to reach the wounds of all, to heal them. Being apostles of mercy means touching and soothing the wounds that today afflict the bodies and souls of many of our brothers and sisters. The Holy Father also called for a special collection at Masses globally on April 24th to assist those who are suffering from the effects of the war in eastern Ukraine, who, quote, thirst for reconciliation and peace. He said the collection is a way of reaching out with aid and, quote, expresses my personal closeness and the solidarity of the entire church. As the primaries rage on in the United States, many are wondering, does the Catholic Church provide any guidance on how to form my conscience to know how to pick a candidate? In the Philippines, elections for the president are coming up in May, and a bishop there has responded to that very question by providing guidelines for how to assess the worthiness of candidates just in time for all those who will be entering the voting booth soon. His name is Bishop Socrates Villegas, and his formula is simple. In fact, it goes straight back to the Old Testament. He says, quote, use the age-old standard set by our Judeo-Christian tradition, the Ten Commandments. A general election is approaching on May 9th in the Philippines for executive and legislative branches for all levels of government, national, provincial, and local. And Archbishop Villegas, who's also the president of the Philippine Bishops' Conference, wrote a pastoral letter with wisdom for all, as he provides guidelines for how to consider each of the commandments to assess the worthiness of candidates. You can read Archbishop Villegas' full pastoral letter on the diocesan website. They say that all roads lead to Rome, and that's certainly the case for the Torch of St. Benedict, which made its way to its hometown of Casino this week. The torch is a symbol of peace, and on March 2nd, Pope Francis blessed it during a public papal audience in Rome before it was taken to the city of Amsterdam. Since the Netherlands currently holds the six-month rotating presidency of the Council of the European Union. The voyage of the torch kicked off on Saturday, February 27th, with its lighting in the crypt of St. Benedict Basilica. The tradition of the pilgrimage of the torch of St. Benedict began in 1964, when Pope Paul VI proclaimed St. Benedict of Norcia one of the patrons of Europe. 
It travels to different cities each year. And this week, the torch returned to Italy with fanfare and processions in three Benedictine towns, Casino, Subiaco, and Norcia. After being carried by foot along what's called the Route of St. Benedict, this is a walking route from Monte Cassino to Norcia, more than 185 miles, that goes along trails and rural roads, stomping at special churches, monasteries, and passing through locations where St. Benedict lived and ministered. In a few minutes, Voice of the Vatican will go up close with Craig Miller, the president of FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, which has sent hundreds of Catholic young adults out as missionaries on 113 U.S. college campuses. But first, more headline news. An article in a British-based medical ethics journal has stated that doctors should have the right to take organs from living patients who want to euthanize themselves, so these organs can be used in transplant surgery. The proposal made by Jan Bolin, a researcher in Holland, purports that those who want to be killed should be sedated in hospital, then allowed to die after the removal of their vital organs. It's called heart-beating organ donation euthanasia and involves an operation in which organs would be taken from still living patients who've given permission. Voice of the Vatican spoke to ethics professor Father Robert Gall to understand the church's take on this proposal. This recent publication of Biomedical Ethics Journal is a wake-up call, really, to all of us, to help us to think more deeply about bioethical issues. Because on the surface, this seems like a really good idea. Because it's, it's really useful, and it really corresponds to utilitarian criteria of ethics, according to which when you have consent of people and you have a, what looks like a good outcome, this all seems really positive. Because you have people who are in need of an organ donation, including a vital organ donation, for instance, even a heart, and then you have other people who are thinking about ending their lives in order to end their suffering. And they ask to be euthanized. And then subsequent to their being euthanized, once they're dead, their organs are removed and they're donated to these recipients who really need them in order to stay alive. Now, the Medical Ethics Journal has proposed, in order to get fresher organs, why do we have to wait until the euthanized patient is dead? Why don't we just remove the organ while they're losing consciousness, give them anesthesia, they won't realize what's happening, they're dying in any case, and then we can donate this fresh organ to the organ recipient. And it all seems like a really nice thing, especially if you have full consent, informed consent given by the people involved. But we should be horrified by this practice, and it should be a wake-up call to all of us, especially regarding euthanasia. Because euthanasia is, a, is an abuse of the human being these are people who are suffering and they ought to be helped. They ought not to be killed. And we ought to uh, help uh, and accompany people who are considering to be euthanized rather than falling into this vortex, this spiral, which could lead to really horrible things like people offering money in order to pay them because I'd like your organ and you're thinking about dying, you're about to die in any case, so why don't you just call it quits earlier and you can accept my money? This can lead to horrific abuse that we should all be afraid of, especially if the government gets involved and government that is offering health care and it's a way for them to save money and even to make money by ending people's lives earlier. So especially as Christians, as Catholics, we should defend the human being from natural conception until their natural death. And we should help people to live a company so they find meaning in their lives, even when they're suffering. So that, like Jesus on the cross, they can appreciate that even when they're suffering and they're approaching the end of their lives, they can be winning an infinite treasure in heaven, including for many other people. Harvesting live organs for transplant surgery from patients who've decided to take their own lives is allowed in Belgium and Holland, the European countries where euthanasia is legal. Around 200 delegates from around the world attended the 11th annual Vatican-sponsored Exorcism Conference this week, which addressed the theoretical and practical implications of the ministry of exorcism. Guests included priests and nuns, but also psychiatrists and sociologists, doctors and criminologists. Meant to take a multidisciplinary approach to exorcism, that examined occultism and demonology, as well as discerning the demonic from mental psychoses and the criminology of Satanism. Throughout his papacy, Pope Francis has repeated a common theme, exhorting the faithful to put on the full armor of God and guard themselves against the real attacks of the devil. Coming up, 
Up Close with Focus, a national outreach building missionaries to meet college students where they are and to invite them into growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And coming to a theater near you, a chance to see papal basilicas in 3D. And if you are wondering how to keep up with all of those great papal selfies, we'll tell you about a new way you can follow Pope Francis on social media. And are faith and science compatible? In keeping with our conversation on medical ethics, this week's Tweet of the Week comes from an astronomer who responds to that very question. Media is powerful. It can change a culture. It can change a whole generation. It can impact the entire globe. Two years ago, Shalom World TV was a dream. Today, it's a reality. A commercial-free, high-definition television network broadcasting from the United States of America, reaching 375 million English-speaking people around the globe. We want to reach to the ends of the earth. Throughout the year, Shalom missionaries work day and night to accomplish this mission, to produce programs that evangelize the culture. What is wrong with Connor's Tonight on Seekers. I can make time for you. For divine knowledge. We want to continue this mission. We want to produce more programs to impact this generation positively. Will you be with us? Can you take a commitment of donating just $25 a month for the next 12 months? We assure you of our prayers. Visit shalomworld.org slash donate today. We thank you for your generosity. Almost 80% of those who leave the Catholic faith do so by the age of 23. This staggering statistic put out by a Pew study shows that the need for evangelizing youth is real and urgent. To find out more, Voice of the Vatican sat down with Craig Miller while he was in Rome for a conference. Craig is the president of the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, better known by the acronym FOCUS. The FOCUS Outreach strives to fulfill the Great Commission of Christ by nurturing college students to become full-time Catholic missionaries. The mission territories are college campuses, where over 500 young missionaries have been sent out to 113 campuses to build relationship and to invite their peers into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and His Church. FOCUS aims to launch students into lifelong Catholic mission by inspiring and equipping its missionaries for a lifetime of Christ-centered evangelization, of discipleship and friendship, through which they can lead others to the same. Thank you so much for being here with Voice of the Vatican. We're so happy to have you, and we're so happy to be learning more about FOCUS today. Would you tell us a bit about what FOCUS is, about its mission? I'd be glad to. FOCUS started in 1998 uh, with one person, and today we're a staff of a little over 600. We reach about 20,000 college students in the U.S. and um, soon, hopefully in the next year, looking to have an international presence starting in Europe. Our mission is really just uh, at a very relational level, one soul at a time, uh, to make that introduction to Jesus Christ and to, to bring that person in close relationship with them, but not to stop there. Uh, we hope that that person goes on to lifelong what we call lifelong Catholic mission. Sure. And what that means is um, they may spend a couple of years with us, we hope that they spend the rest of their lifetime with Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and that our Lord becomes Lord of everything they do, which would make them great doctors and lawyers and business people. Indeed. But more importantly, in the full living out of mission, what we hope they do, what we train them to do, is to invest their lives in others. So somebody at some point in their time in college, in a very personal way, in a very intimate way, made that introduction to Christ in their life, but also walked with them. And if we do our job well, we'll build them in a way and, and send them in a way so that they know how to do that with others. Wow. And who are these missionaries? Missionaries, most of them, about two-thirds of them, were college students that had this direct and personal contact with a missionary okay. while they were a student. And, uh, you know, I think just out of an exchange of, of what our Lord has brought in their life in, 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 in gratitude for that, mm. so many are moved to say, you know, we ask for a two-year commitment. 
I'll give two years. I'll give two years and I'll, I'll, I'll give this to others. And hopefully, they, again, they keep going after the two years, but two years in a very formal way. Um, they structure their lives living on college campuses with college students very relevant to the problems, the pain, the experiences of a college student. They're there living with those college students and sharing in the same way. And um, again, after on average of about three and a half years, they move on uh, other paths and other things they're doing in their, uh, to continue with other things they'll do in their life, uh, but hopefully have touched in, in a model that we call spiritual multiplication. Because if you touch two and yes. each of those touch two, theoretically, uh, you could reach the whole world in the lifetime of Jesus Christ, 33 Let's do years. It. <laughs> mm, absolutely. Yeah. So, Craig, what is it like at a college campus for a focused missionary walking into this territory? Where do they begin? Oh, it, it's got to be a little scary. So we, we ask our new, co these college students that just graduate and take on this role, we ask them, uh, would you go anywhere we send you in the country mm -hmm. on this two plus year journey? Would you, would you go anywhere? And they say yes. And we say, by the way, would you raise all of your own support, your individual living expenses and what it, and, and, and what it takes for you to be out there? And they say yes to that. We ask for one year of a, a fast from dating because we want them to be completely distracted, mm -hmm. no pressure in what they're doing. Right. Uh, and they say yes to that. And then we just put them out there and with hopefully uh, enough training so that they'll be good at what they do. Mm -hmm. And hopefully with enough prayer so they'll be connected sure. into our, to, to God in the way that they should be in this type of work. Um, and hopefully enough guidance and supervision with uh, some of the structures we put in place. But other than that, it's just a walk with their courage and their boldness. And they're going out and meeting people they've never met and they're establishing right. real friendships with people that are just from all over the country, places where they've never been mm -hmm. normally. Typically, we take them out of their school and put them in another school somewhere else in the country. Okay. So it's a totally new environment for them. And, and uh, they'll go out with in a team of four, two men and two women. And um, that's, their, that's sort of their expedition team. They'll, wow. they'll make it happen from there. Gosh, and you mentioned the training that you offer. What mm -hmm. is the training like? The training is every your first 57 weeks on uh, on mission with focus, we consider you new staff. Okay. So over that 57 week period, there is 10 weeks of you're doing nothing but training, five mm -hmm. weeks each summer, those first two summers. And then we do ongoing training via electronic app and reach. You know, we have something called Mission University. We deliver materials to the team. The team sits down and goes, goes through the material week by week. But it is everything from really teaching them what we call the apostolic elements, the practical elements, how to share your faith, how to lead a Bible study, to um, spiritual formation, to just human character formation. Right. Th everything that you would need to, be, uh, to, to, to try to be successful reaching souls on college campuses. It goes from one soul to teaching that soul uh, how to live their life with uh, and give their life in such a way that, uh, that, that you would give your, your best to our Lord in everything that you do. Mm -hmm. And then if you do that well, you have a plan for life that you share with other people. And hopefully there's a culture that evolves through that, a culture that spreads and changes and converts. Mm -hmm. uh, but it never, I don't think it ever comes down to something that's more beautiful than that individual point of conversion when somebody says yes. Craig, what happens after you have finished with a term of offering your, your time and your talent and, and love of the Lord to being a missionary, where do you go from there? What's next? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's a, your, your question is very timely. Focus is thinking about this right now. We have about 20,000 students that, we have, that we're working with today that, and also that we've worked with in the past. Mm -hmm. And the ones we work with in the past, we know that they have struggles as young adults both struggles in their personal life, but really in the, what we've trained them to do to live out apostolate. Mm -hmm. um, there are struggles there. How do they engage in a parish? How do they engage their community and their friends and their workplace? They knew how to do that on a college campus, but they don't always know how to do that in the different environments. And so we're starting more of an intentional program to reach out to those 20,000, provide them with the training. We're actually working with some of them individually where we will, as employees of Focus, mm -hmm. put them into parishes and have them work with other young adults. Mm -hmm. And so we're really excited about this piece because I, I, um, as much as I'm and the rest of Focus are committed to the work of Focus on a college campus, we actually believe that's a, that's a turning point, that's a leverage point in a young person's life. Sure. Um, the college campus is, is not the structure the church has given us. The church has given us the structure of the parish. And mm -hmm. so to take those people who are on lifelong mission and put them into the parishes and train them to do the same thing where they win and build and, and, and send out others as missionary right. disciples of the church, 
Um, that's what we're excited about. It is such an exciting prospect, isn't it? I hope so, yeah. I, I believe it is. Yes. And, and Craig, I know that you sponsor conferences mm -hmm. as well. Will you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Uh, we, have our, we have multiple conferences, our two largest conferences. We do this kind of in a retreat and conference cycle. We, we um, it, it involves also mission trips, so where we get into the life of the student and we try to give them places where they can apply their faith. Okay. Uh, our, but our conferences uh, are our largest events, our largest gatherings. Every other year, we do a, a conference called Seek, and it's open to all of our college students. Anybody can come. Last year, about ten thousand came. And in fact, Shalom World TV broadcast. That is right. It. Thank yes. you for that. Yes. That was that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, to, to have a person come who really doesn't even know why they're there sometimes. They got an invitation two hours before the bus was leaving. Right. And they said, sure, I'll do this, and, um, and, and made a decision. Uh, it, it, it's, the fruit of that is just unbelievable and so moving. Wow. There is a, 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 a different conference which is move, moving in a different way, and that is a smaller conference which is called Student Leadership Summit. And that's an invitation conference where we take those students who have made that commitment to Christ, they've given their life to Christ, I'll follow him at any cost, but they've not yet made that commitment that I want any, I'll give at any cost for others to follow Christ. Okay. We think with a conference and a little bit of inspiration and a little bit of training, we can nudge them in that direction. So through this leadership summit, we'll invite several thousand to come and in a, in a deeper way be formed in their faith. They've made those commitments for okay. themselves, but in a deeper way to be formed so they can share their faith with others. Well, we certainly appreciate your good work of focus. Thank you for what you're doing to build up these Catholic missionaries. And we at Shalom World TV wish you all the best. And please know that we will be praying for you. Thank you. God yeah. bless you in your work. God bless you. Thank you. Not that long ago, children grew up in a simpler world. We rode our bikes to the corner store and played outside until dark. Face to face, in person, that's how we connected. Family dinners happened every night. We had a mother and a father together under one roof, and we had good role models. Everything has changed. We're in a war for the hearts, minds, and souls of this generation. They're growing up in a world with the power to destroy them. Never before has the world been this complicated. Never before have young people been more in danger of losing their way. Never before has winning the hearts and minds of a generation been more important than it is right now. At Focus, we believe in fighting for our young people. And when we do, we see lives transformed. And it starts with the most important things. One-on-one, -on -one, authentic friendships, real conversations, students in community, face-to-face -face fellowship. We give them an opportunity to go deeper, to grow, to serve, to teach others. We share Jesus Christ. We need you to join the fight for our young people, for the church, for our world. The time is now. Imagine what we can do together. If you can't make a pilgrimage to the Eternal City during the Jubilee year this year, filmmakers have found a way to bring Rome to you. A 90-minute film entitled St. Peter's and the Papal Basilicas of Rome will take the viewer on a thrilling 3D tour of the four major papal basilicas of Rome. That is St. Peter's, St. John Lateran, St. Mary Major, and St. Paul's Outside the Walls. The film gives the viewer the chance to become immersed in the scene and to be in direct contact with works of art by masters such as Giotto, Michelangelo, and Bernini even encountering art that is rarely publicly viewed or details otherwise unseen, like Michelangelo's signature on the Pietà. The film will be distributed in cinemas in over 50 countries, shown only from April 11th to 13th. It's produced by the Vatican Television Center with Sky 3D and in collaboration with the Italian Ministry of Heritage and Culture. There are whole new ways to boost your prayer power using smart technology. Now it's time for Techno. Pope Francis has shattered yet another social media record. Not long after he pressed the button on the tablet that launched his very own Instagram account, 
And from that moment, the Francisco account started gaining followers at the jaw-dropping rate of 1,000 per minute, amassing 1 million followers in under 12 hours. Now, this shattered the previous record that was held by David Beckham, who took twice as long to gain that many followers. On average, the posts to the Francisco account accrue approximately 212,000 likes and 6,299 comments each. Now, founded in 2010, Instagram has approximately 400 million users worldwide and shares photos and videos with the community of followers. The name of Pope Francis' account is Franciscum, which is his name in Latin. The first picture sent out on the Instagram account was one of the Holy Father kneeling in prayer with the words, pray for me, accompanying it. The account will also be sending out photos from the Vatican newspaper, Lo Sovertoire Romano, and short videos of events at the Vatican. This week's Tweet of the Week comes from the Diocese of Salt Lake City in the U.S. Recently, the diocese hosted a Vatican astronomer from Rome for a lecture. The official diocesan Twitter account of Salt Lake City tweeted out a poignant statement made by the Vatican astronomer, his name is Brother Guy Cusomano, about the relationship between faith and science. The tweet read, I don't use science to prove religion. Religion gives me confidence to do my science. As Pope John Paul II wrote in his document, Fides et Ratio, Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. And those two wings cannot be separated as they stem from the same source. All week long, you can keep up with the latest happenings in Rome on our Twitter feed, at Voice of Vatican. And be sure to like us on Facebook at Voice of the Vatican. And check our social media feeds for breaking news and information about upcoming guests and features. And we want to hear your voice, too. Email your questions, stories, and news to vov at shalomworld.org. This is Ashley Norona in Rome wishing you a blessed week. May God bless you and your family. Saying ciao for now from the Eternal City, I'll see you next week on Voice of the Vatican. From Rome to your home, only on Shalom World TV.